Hi, this is Mike Paulson. Welcome again to another Bible study video presentation of the risen Savior Jesus Christ from a King James 1611 Bible only and only from the Apostle Paul. I'm going to skip all my intro and all my conclusions because this is just part of a series. 100 plus goodnesses of God. This time we're going to get into detail. And the detail we're going to look at here is when you are a quickened and saved, now a Christian, a true Christian, uh, we learn some things about the church that are very important. And so let's get right into it here. The church, the local church. By the way, I, I do want to I just have to say this because this is so important. None of this material, none of this, none of these goodnesses are found in, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. They're not found in Acts chapters 1 through 8, and they're not found from Hebrews to Jude. So if your pastor's preaching all this stuff out of Gospels and, and Acts and Hebrews and stuff, then, or James or 1st, 2nd Peter, which is a great guilt uh, causing uh, books to get out of unto the Gentiles today, or Jude or whatever. Um, or first, second, third John, especially first John, he's wrong. He's he's teaching profane and vain babblings. Let's get into the church. We're going to look at three different aspects of this thing. One is we're going to uh, show why we are to destroy the magnificence of today's scripturally corrupt church as it was designed for Peter and the Jews, not us. Then we're going to look at what really is the church we're part of today, part of the maturing and scripturally true and we call it the universal church from all over the world are all part of the body of Christ. And that's designed for Paul to teach to us Gentiles. And then the third little element we're going to look at is the, because I've heard this so many times here recently, know who the children of disobedience really are. Because these modern pastors and these modern churches are teaching that if you do something wrong as a Christian, then you are suddenly a child of disobedience and you are going to get God's wrath. And that is so wrong, so wrong. So we're going to look at the children of disobedience, who they really are and who they are not, and why that is. Let's just get right into it. To destroy the magnificence of today's corrupt local church, Acts chapter 19, 24 to 28. It's a great story there. It's a true story. Uh, these people were concerned that Paul's teachings came along and destroyed their income from their religious bookstores and their... Uh, sales racks of statues and CDs and DVDs, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, he also destroyed the magnificence of their temple. And uh, these churches today consider themselves Old Testament temples. That's another story in itself. But uh, that is worth destroying, and Paul's teachings will destroy that magnificence. I'm not looking to destroy the churches, the buildings, the people, anything like that. It's just the magnificence of what those churches are. The draw of the marketed magnificence of the local church today needs to be exposed for what it is so we can see for ourselves that we should despise our past local church and destroy the magnificence that had been created in our mind about that wonderful place with their impressive and educated pastor, along with the loving and caring people, with the best worship leader and a super talented choir or piano player, or maybe not the greatest choir, but they sure try, they sure mean well, sometimes even a band or orchestra that magnificent kingdom of heaven, that earthly kingdom, and to pretend spiritual kingdom of God is nothing but a marketing draw to get church members caught up into Satan's snare. It is a complete setup for Satan's use and for his future worship. Along with those wonderful people pretending to be holy and blessed within their local church, we can also add to their wonderful facilities, the extra programs of food, fun, and frivolous excitement, the modern taking materials they use, their increased emphasis on all kinds of music, including the wonderful professional sounding and looking performances and concerts, including the latest noise they call music, and, and feel good music for the teens, and silly good works fairy tales with the cartoon design Bible personalities for the little kids, along with their professional performances, and especially brought in families will bring in their feet stomping emotional musical families, as I said, and those specially famous world personalities. And they all serve one purpose, and that is to have favor with all the people. So they will come and join their social club that has been designed for the people. 
And I say it again, to worship, like Paul said, to worship their unknown God, whom they unknowingly worship and serve the creature more than the creator. And I do suggest that you pause, if you haven't done so already, and study Acts 19, 24 to 28, Acts 17, 23, and Romans 1, 25. The pastors now shorten sermons that they do in these churches cause divisions and offenses contrary to Paul's doctrine as they serve their own belly by their good words and fair speeches that deceive the hearts of the simple. Their modern profane and vain babblings overthrow their congregation's own faith. 2 Timothy 2.16. Their fleshy, flashy worship music praises Satan using all kinds of music, which only brings the people closer to being part of the time of great tribulation, when Satan fulfills his goal of being like the Most High by demanding worldwide worship from his own designed socialist, communist, global government, religion, health, education, and economy. So it's all taken from the design from Peter's church back in Acts chapter 2, and it was a church for the Jews. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart because Peter just told them they finally convinced them that they'd killed their, their Messiah. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So if you want your church to grow in numbers, then you look to Acts chapter 2, 37 to 41, and you find out that you need to repent and be baptized, and you'll be given the gift of the Holy Ghost. And see, that's what's going on in the Pentecostal churches today. And actually, more and more Baptist churches are picking up on the Pentecostal flavoring. And so let's just keep going here. Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. This is also the Great Commission. And this is when they wanted to have people come. The Jews wanted the people to come to the church. And this is, what, this is how they designed it. Have you noticed anything in there that we see in our churches today? It's all in there. The emphasis is on their physical kingdom of heaven on earth. And they have the things in there. They have water baptism, teaching apostolic doctrine. They're big on fellowship, and they're really big on fellowship, uh, prayers. And we're, I know some of us are lonely for fellowship, and there's nothing wrong with fellowship. But uh, these are the things that were part of it. Prayers. They have prayer meetings and prayer change and all sorts of prayer stuff. And we learn from Paul, pray without ceasing. Whole another, no, whole another teaching. They feared God's severity, wonders and signs and miracles. That's Mark chapter sixteen. Again, that's the Great Commission, and uh, we're seeing those things today. By the way, more and more miracles, wonders, and signs, which is which is all satanic. And another sermon on its own. All things in common, sold everything to everybody else, helped others. One accord, communion, Lord's Supper, uh, singleness, praises. A singleness would be one Bible today, but churches today have like. 20, 30, 40 Bibles in there. How can they have singleness? How can they have all things in common? They can't. There's no way. But the big punch, the big push here is having favor with everyone. So the churches today are doing everything they can to have favor with everyone. They're having Halloween parties. They're having Christmas parties. They're having food activities. They're having, you name it. They, they just do it. They do anything, pick, they do anything to get people to come to their church. And they'll do any kind of music. They'll do all kinds of music and on and on I can go. But I won't because I think most of you have heard me do that. But the whole goal is have favor with everyone. They teach ap apostolic doctrine, the apostles' doctrine. They teach water baptism, and they teach communion, the Lord's Supper, and all of that is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts 1 through 8, and Hebrews through Jude. That is not taught to us by Paul. Simple as that. 
So what is it that Paul teaches us? Paul teaches us the universal true church. And I, know, I hate to use the word true church because I know there's a cult out there that says they are the true church. Uh, we're looking at the body of Christ. Universal meanings all over the world. People that are saved, quickened uh, in Russia or in Scotland, Maggie, or in California, or in Florida, Canada, Australia, down south there, on the other side, down under. Uh, we're all part of one church. It's the universal church. It's called the body of Christ. With new design and personal goals to grow in understanding and in one's own manner of life, we are taught about the tools we need along with a new ability to mature as a Christian by looking to Paul's manner of life. We are not just after numbers. We're not trying to have favor with all the people. We're not teaching apostolic doctrine. And we have zero concern about the physical element of our spirituality, church building, parking lots, uh, pay, you know, all that kind of stuff. If you want to be spiritual? Paul says, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Did Paul's writings come from God or didn't they? Apparently, pastors today don't think they did because they sure, they sure try to reject him and they're all part of this conspiracy against Paul. But if these guys want to be spiritual, they need to acknowledge that what Paul writes is from God and is to the Jews. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones, Ephesians chapter 5. So now we look to Paul for our church goals and purpose instead. If we happen to have enough people in town to gather into one place, we would do it, not a problem. And we'd have some of that fellowship, and we'd have the brethren. It'd be tough because that's a that's an important element of the of the body of Christ, just how we'd have to be unified and get along, which I think might be kind of tough uh, these days. We get our own little our own little nose going here. Anyway. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now let's look at that in kind of a summary of three purposes, perfecting of the saints, meaning complete, you know, finishing, we grow to a point, we're, we're, we're perfected, we're, we're, we're full, we're completed. We, to that, we get to that point when we die and be with the Lord as he finishes off our judgment seat. The work of the ministry, there are things that we could do, giving out tracts and, and uh, Bibles to people. There's things that we could do, work of the ministry. And edifying, our job is to edify. Three goals. One, till we all come in, the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. And it's all done through the Word of God, by the way, not any feelings or, or John chapter 14 stuff, until the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We are to grow as Christians. We're to be no more children, tossed to and fro, or carried about with every wind of doctrine. So it, that's a good definition of children, by the way. Tossed to and fro, or carried about with every wind of doctrine, but the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And if we look at our schools today, what's going on in the news, we, we sure understand that. And to speak the truth in love, so we may grow up into him in all things. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And then the point of the brethren, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. That's the part I know I miserably failed as a website uh, pastor kind of guy. We we're so we we're so spread apart from Scotland to Australia to uh, we had some, uh, some, some folks from uh, China. And uh, we have to down in Africa, and then America and Canada, and, and uh, you know we're all everywhere. We're scattered, 
and I always wished we could have gotten together on Zoom or something and really met each other and and uh, fitly joined together and compacted with that which every joint supplies to be there for each other. That would that is so important. And I know we all lack that. That's I failed that one big time. Well, this church that our local our body of Christ that we are, we are to be taught. Teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly. That means seriously, not just not drinking. Soberly, it's a serious thing. That's what's going on here. Uh, not to have righteous living, that sort of thing. Righteously and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And that's what we have to maintain even while we watch our country go down the tubes and the world and the Satan coming in and all that stuff that's going on here. Just amazing stuff here. We have to still try to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. In the meantime, looking for that blessed hope and the great appearing. Okay, get back to the stuff. We need to teach sound doctrine. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. That is Titus chapter 2. And for those of you that remember, that was my series, what I call the Pastoral Suicide Series, where we taught Titus chapter 2. And I knew that was going to end the ministry for me, and it did, because uh, nobody wants to hear this part of it. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Aged men, aged women. Young men, young women. Husbands, children, servants. It's all in Titus chapter 2. It's not the law. It's not required or you're disobedient and you got the wrath of God. But that's what Paul would have us do because that's what the risen Savior said. We should be doing these things because now you are saved. Because now you are quickened. I made you alive. Let's get on and do the stuff that we should be doing. And uh, that's all Romans. Okay, face to face now. You've heard me talk, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Okay, so it was done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, meaning Paul's day, we see through a glass darkly. But then, then is referring to when that is perfect is come, and we know that it has in the King James Bible. Then, face to face. For now, during Paul's time, he knew in part, but now shall I know even as also I am known. So we can know in full. We just have to sit down. We have to read and study our scriptures. We can do that now. Now, during Paul's time, abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. So during, before the King James Bible came along, charity was the most important thing because they didn't have a Bible to, to understand fully, to understand face to face, but rather that you prophesy. And Paul said, listen, it's important that we have faith and uh, hope and charity, but the most important thing now is, is prophesying, is preaching and teaching and learning that Bible. We develop an acute awareness and strong desire to despise our former church. Again, back to Acts chapter 19, 21 to 28, 21 to 28. We need to destroy the magnificence that people brag about their churches. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that there be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be said at not, there goes our income, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And they get really angry at Paul over this stuff, and they want to try to kill him. And it's a long story there. It's a short story, actually. It's a good story. And we've got our churches. We've got our uh, temples of the great goddesses and gods and and uh, i can get into that but i won't here but uh, they should be despised and the magnificence should be destroyed that's not hard for me and i could give you a testimony of all the churches i've lived in and worked in and uh i have no bitterness but i sure learned a lot from them but it was they're they're they're, they're just uh, they're just wrong to the max today okay then the last part here learning who the children of disobedience really are and are not Modern Bible versions scare 
their people by saying that the wrath of God will fall upon those who are disobedient. That means Christians, on those Christians who are disobedient. And they stress the word disobedient and obedient. That is a gross, yet typical, translation of perverted and corrupt nonsense. According to a King James Bible, the wrath of God does come upon the children of obedience. But in truth, the King James Bible says that the children of, of obedience are the ones who have been tricked by Satan and are children of Satan. In other words, all the lost people, those that reject the risen Savior through Paul in the King James Bible, those are the children of disobedience, not a Christian who is not being obedient to his pastor, etc., etc. Ephesians 2.2, 2, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, and that's the lost people. Okay? Ephesians 5.6, let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience, and we are not the children of disobedience. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. So we have to realize that the children of disobedience are Satan's children, and those are the people that are not saved. These scriptures are clear that as a Christian, as, as somebody who is quickened and saved, we do not need to worry about the wrath of God. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to attain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. The wrath of God is not going to come upon a quickened Christian who is still being what they would call disobedient. You know, we're still learning. We're trying to grow up. Our flesh gets a hold of things, and it's, and it's the flesh, it's the sin that's in us that does it. How can I say that? You say, well, it's easy, because a truly saved, quickened person is a Christian and is dead to sin. Not a verb, but a noun. We are dead to sin, the existence of sin. And we are dead unto the law. Our bad works, remember, it isn't us doing it. It's the sin that is in us, Romans chapter 7, if you're truly quickened. Those bad works are not imputed to us. Those things will burn at the judgment seat of Christ. There is no threat of God's wrath, also called the severity of God. This is the joy of truthfully taught Christianity. And that is something that exists only as a rarity these days. Yes, of course, as a Christian, we can still choose to ignore the teachings of the risen Savior through Paul. We can do some of them. We can do a lot of them. We can do none of them. We can lose rewards at the judgment seat. We can quench the Spirit. We can grieve the Spirit. Uh, we can choose to go on living in ignorance without a true joy and peace. We can live without understanding and maturity by not reading and studying the inspired, preserved, perfect words of the Lord. But that don't blame God for not being there for you. And I don't mean physically, I mean spiritually. Just remember, we have no reason to fear the severity of God's wrath. This is all just more proof that today's preachers using their modern Bible versions reject the grace of God that Paul preaches and tells their people that they must walk an obedient walk to be blessed or else they will receive the severity of God, the wrath of God. That is also why God says those preachers are evil men and seducers. They shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. God says they are them which are proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. And that's why they call you know, if you're doing the right thing, you're being obedient, you'll gain, because that means you're godly. Yeah, that's why, that's why the Bible tells us to withdraw ourselves from those people. And so to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all of them that believe. 
because their testimony among you was believed in that day. Now let's follow up here. Let's look at the agenda. Real quick, like let's look at the agenda that's going on with all this obedient and disobedient stuff here. First one is to create a strict obedience towards their fearfully weakened pastor. These sermons, by the way, these verses make for a, make for wonderful guilt trip sermons. Hebrews 13, 7, 7, and 17. Verse 7, remember them which have the rule over you, who has spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Now that's written during the tribulation time. They will have to remember them that have the rule over them, and who has spoken to them the word of God, because they won't have the King James Bible to read and study it. And to follow their faith, because they know where they're headed. NIV, though. Look at this. They says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you, which we know they're not, but spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. The NIV also tells people to imitate God, imitate Jesus Christ, imitate Paul. It's just crazy. So here they want you to imitate the faith of your pastor. Remember them which have the rule over you. Now, verse 17 Obey them that have the rule over you, there it is again, and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Boy, you can get a good guilt sermon out of that, can't you? NIV says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. Whoa. Because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. So it's all about obeying your pastor. Ask your pastor anything you're going to do. Buy something, go somewhere, whatever. You need to check with your pastor. And I know pastors that were that way. I know churches that are that way. And they really, the people really do check with their pastor over absolutely everything. And I know a pastor that I had one time tried to demand that on me as well. Crazy stuff. Now, here are some more verses in an NIV, Ephesians 2.2, 2, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So Christian or not, you're going to, if you're, in, if you're disobedient, then you've got the spirit from the kingdom of the air. Who's that? Anyway, uh, Ephesians 5.6. Uh, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. See, that's that refers to Christians, according to that pastor. Galatians 3, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. You've got to make sure you're being obedient to be approved. But now in, in Romans 16, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. Not the obedience of faith, but the obedience that comes from faith. So if you've got your true faith and you really are saved, then obedience comes from that crazy. And then 2 Corinthians 9, 13, NIV, because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession. So you want to be obedient if you're going to say you're a Christian. So you see what I'm saying there? Now, King James Bible, towards your pastor or teacher, according to Paul, and we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. And are over you in the Lord. Now, over you in the Lord does not mean you submit to him. He's just doing the job of preaching and studying. Not the job for you instead of you doing it. He's just doing it to guide you along. And admonish you. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Got to consider what they've done for you. How they showed you. How they've helped you mature. How they've helped you learn about the goodness of God. I mean, all those sorts of things. And be at peace among yourselves. Don't have to submit. Don't have to obey. Don't have to worry about the uh, wrath of God coming on you if you don't obey me. That's how that works out. It's amazing stuff. And then to me, this I just thought about this the other day. Brainwash Christians today into the strict, obedient mindset so they will be willingly obedient to worship the Antichrist. Or they die. 
They will have to choose between being obedient to Jesus Christ and the word of God, being anointed as they will be, the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. Now that anointing does not take place, it does not exist to us today, uh, like, like they say it does in John 14. This is not the way it is today. We'll talk about anointing in another in another segment here. First John 2, 27 is where that definition of anointing comes from. Which, by the way, if somebody who believes that they are anointed by Je by the, um, you know, by God, then it says here, uh, ye not that any man teach you. This is why these people are, are impossible to teach, because, well, they think God gives them everything. It's that simple. They don't care if the Bible says what it says. They just don't care. You can't teach them anything. I've tried and tried and tried. And if you want to know more about what's going on during the tribulation, during these days that we're talking about here, just read from Hebrews to Jude and you see all the details. And then it says, Revelation 20, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hand, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now, that is not a mistake in the King James Bible. It says upon their foreheads. And there's a reason for that, but I'm going to skip all that. You, you, can still have that, you still have to have that mark in your forehead or in your hand. But if you put something in your forehead, you're still, you're still working on that forehead up there. There's a reason for that. I'm sure... Uh, people like to think that's a mistake. It's not. It's what it, it's a word he wants there. Or, if they're not going to choose to be obedient to Jesus Christ and the Word of God, according to what they're anointed with, because there won't be a King James Bible then, or to the so-called pretend Christians, who not only have already accepted another Jesus, uh, but also to him who comes down and demands obedience and worship of all kinds of music, that they have been programmed and prepared to obediently enjoy, they have also taken the mark of God, thinking themselves to be safe from evil today and during the tribulation. So these churches today are teaching modern Christians, who have another Jesus, and they think they are taught that they have the mark of God, and so as a result of that mark of God, they will not suffer like people will be during the tribulation because they've got the mark of God. So there's going to be people that uh, they're going to be thinking, I need to get the mark of God. And here are, these, here are these churches giving out this mark when really it's going to be the mark of the beast. So people are being programmed and brainwashed into this obedient nonsense that will carry them right into the tribulation carry them right up to the obedience of worshiping and bowing down to the Antichrist because they've already been taught how to do it. And the worshiping will be with all kinds of music because they've got that already set up in their little hearts and minds. It's quite the thing, wouldn't you say? NIV pastors tell readers to take the mark of God. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. Ephesians 1.13 the promised Holy Spirit set his seal of ownership on us. Sealed to this inscription, the Lord knows those who are his. And then these pastors told people, God protects you from the evil today and suffering and during the tribulation. So if you are suffering today, these people, they, they may not say anything to you, but they're judging you by thinking, well, see, you're not, you're, you're being disobedient. This is the way life is such a challenge. I know they think that. I've heard them say that. Nonsense. Isn't that just nonsense? What kind of joy, of, what kind of a God would be, would be that way? That's why this obedience kick is what it is. And then Revelation 13, read the whole chapter of Revelation 13. Read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and read uh, Revelation chapter 20. Uh, these are things to be reading. If I, what's, coming, what's coming up here? But we don't have to worry about the wrath of God. And we certainly don't have to worry about the wrath of God today because we're being disobedient in the eyes of these pastors and these modern Christians. I'll say it again. They think that's what's happening to us. They think because we're being disobedient, we aren't living the kind of successful, blessed life that they are.
unbelievable. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. The image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So that's forced obedience. And as he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, in order to get into your forehead, you've got to be on it. So that's kind of what that's all about. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. What a socialistic program that is, isn't it? And that's all coming about amazing stuff. So there's the stuff about the church. Despise and destroy the magnificence. Magnificence, there we go. And the true church, the body of Christ, the universal church, our, our goals and objectives there and how that works for us today. How to look at your pastor, teacher today. And then this part about the obedience and how they have really twisted that terribly so. Now I'm going to also skip the ending here because this is just a, a small part of a series. If you have never seen this before, then uh, pause and uh, look at this page, read them through. Remember, the goodness of God is still in place for us today, and it's still there to us, but not much longer. This is the dispensation of the grace of God. There you have the stuff on the church.